Hi, Michael. Welcome in the Keiharde podcast. Thanks for being on the show. Sure, sure, sure. We got lots of time right now. Yes, I'm happy with that. Um, if you, if it's all right with you, I want to go back first, uh, back in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, where um, Halloween was born. Uh, Ingo Schwichtenberg and Markus Groskopf and Michael Weikart, the, the, the founder of the band. Am I right? I think so, yeah. 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 And then you came into the band after Walls of Jericho and um, the Keeper albums. I heard I, or I read that the both Keeper albums were written on your voice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it all started with Marcus, the bass player, showing up uh, at the rehearsal place where I was practicing with my with my band. Mm -hmm. I, I had the, the opportunity, which was actually pretty great looking back at it now. I was able to still use a room in the school for free, even though I wasn't going to that school anymore. I was like already starting to 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 learn something in in the in the in the adult way you know I was um, I don't know what the English word for it is but I was I was starting to to do some work yeah uh, and I, and I was still able to get for free into this school room and rehearse with my band there which was amazing but that's where Marcus once showed up and said you know <laughs> the, the, the previous singer uh, doesn't want to sing anymore he wants to play the guitar and we need to sing all like you you know um, like and, and he gave me walls of Jericho and I didn't like it so I didn't call back and then and then, <laughs> then like uh, uh, a couple of weeks later yeah. uh, I, I still remember I was still living in, at my mother's place and I was I was in the bath tube and my mother came and there's a guy called Michael Wycat he wants to talk to you and she, she handed the, the phone over to me and then he why he was saying, yeah I know Walt Jericho is a bit punky and stuff like that but we need we need someone like you to to, to develop and to, to move forward and to do something more and stuff like that and he said why don't you just show up to the rehearsal room uh, to, to one of our rehearsals and 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 play some of the stuff to you that we've written for your voice and that's what I did. And that was a game changer for me. They had like a whole bunch of the songs that ended up on the Keeper Records by then, yeah. uh, written for my voice. The first time that I saw you was um, September 1988. Okay. In Monsters of Rock, Tilburg. Ah. Um, that was on a Sunday. And on Monday, I went to the record store and bought both CDs, Keeper 1 and Keeper 2, because... You blew me away with your performance on that day. All right, yeah. I cool. didn't know you by then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the way it goes sometimes. That's why you're touring sometimes, especially festivals. Yeah. If on festivals, you also play to people who don't necessarily came to the festival because of you. You know. Really, and we uh, talked about this phenomenon, knowing new bands on a festival last week on the podcast. That's the beautiful thing about festivals. You walk into a room, you walk into a tent or to a stage and you got blown blown away by a new, a new band you doesn't know at all. That was great. That's a great thing about festivals because you, you usually don't buy a ticket of a band you don't know, you know, and, 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 and you, you got to see new bands in a, in, a, in a more easy way and festivals are great. For, that's the only thing that I personally like about Spotify, for instance. Yeah. I don't like it replacing um, the way people um, buy music because I, I I still think it's a different thing if you own a record, you yeah. know. And I but I use Spotify to find music sometimes. Sometimes the the suggestions are great, and if I like something, I'm I'm getting the CD because I want to have it. Yeah. I don't want to rent it. I know I know the feeling. I know the feeling, but that that. First period of keeper success. How was that for you guys? Were you overwhelmed? I must say that I was so convinced about the crap that we did that that I wasn't surprised. I was to me. I, I still remember, and I was just I just turned eighteen. Yeah. When I when I recorded the first album, and and I still remember when the album was done, and we had I had. In those days, there was no CDs. It was a I had a vinyl sort of preprint of of the of the masters, and I, I still remember I was listening to the album with a friend of mine, 
and I was making all my plans, you know, I was like drawing a picture how great it's going to be and we're going to play live and then we're going to do this and that. And he was just looking at me saying, you know, I wish you all the best, but it's very difficult you know, in the business to, to get successful and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> and I was like, don't you hear that? I mean, it's, it's got to go like rock and like, you know, I was so convinced about it. It's gold. It's gold. I was so convinced about it. Yeah. And, 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 and that's why I wasn't surprised. I felt like, I felt like it's, it's it easily things like that get easily mistaken as arrogance, but that's not arrogance. When you, when you're convinced about the music you're doing, especially when you're young, you have a very naive way of looking at life. You, you, you tend to believe everything that's great is going to make it, you know? Yeah. So I, I, I remember that even like the, 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 the real big daddies of music, you know, like Paul McCartney, uh, he, he said the same thing one. And I, I think it was John Lennon who actually said when they started off, they, they, they honestly thought they were the best band in the world. And, and he says, believe it or not, that's what has gotten us to the point of success because this gives you what you do, a certain drive, a certain force. That's why I'm always saying to people, to younger musicians, you got to do, you got to work on your music so that you believe in it, that you yeah. think it's fantastic, because that's the only way it has the energy to, to reach others in the same sort of way, you know? Yeah. Now, yeah, the Beatles came back from Hamburg, had their first show in Liverpool, and they really stood on stage to conquer the world. Their first show back in England was overwhelming for the crowd. They went crazy and they believed in what they did. Yeah, 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 and, and that's the thing. If you, but it's, you can't fake it. You know what I mean? There, there's these, there, there are these books about self-fulfilling prophecies and stuff like that that try to train you to believe in you so that it's, it's going to come true. But you can't fake it. You either do believe in it or not. You know what I mean? And if you, that, another thing with believing in yourself. You know what I mean? If mm -hmm. you don't believe in yourself, if you have, if you have these, these, these self-destructive doubts about yourself. It needs to be in balance, of course, you know? Yeah. It always needs to be in balance. It's also good to have a bit of humility and uh, and, and stuff like that. But you got to believe in yourself. Otherwise, you will never get anywhere. It's, it's just the way it is. And with music, it's the same thing. Yeah. If you don't believe in what you're doing, how can anyone else? Yes. Completely true. Uh, du during the Keepers Tour, 1989, Kai left the band. And yeah. I'm telling this by because we are getting into the Pumpkin United tour later on, and then the younger younger listeners can understand what happened. He uh, left, left after the tour, not not during. Not the tour. during the tour. Oh, after the tour. Yeah. Um, he was a kind of a leader in the band, I think. No, we didn't huh? have any of those. It's, it always gets it always gets put like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, there was never anything like that. We were never the type of band where. Uh, You have natural leaders. Yeah. yeah. You, have, you have, I mean, Kai and Waiki were the main songwriters. So in that sense, you know, they, they were leading that, that department. But yeah. there was never any band leader or anything or any, anyone in the band who was telling the others what to do. No. This, this was not, that was never the way it is. It has been placed like that, uh, even by the band afterwards. But, uh, you know, when bands split up, they tend to twist things in a way that, that the fans love them. So. <laughs> It's is like was it like at that time uh, like a football club yeah. uh, during a transfer period yeah. uh, the, one of the star players left the, the the team there comes a new player in and there's a complete other new dynamic in the dressing room yeah yeah oh yeah uh, that was definitely the case uh, not kind not being a band, uh, the band leader or anything like that mm -hmm. it definitely wasn't you know we all lead ourselves if you, if you, if you know what I mean yeah. but he he was he He was important for the whole balance. And when he was gone, the balance was gone. Or it was just not working anymore. We were just constantly fighting. And it did not change when Roland came in. He was, he was, he was, he was not able to balance that out. It just needed him, you know. Mm -hmm. And it needed Kai, actually, for, for the, the first Halloween band to function the, the way it did. And when he was out of the band... It didn't work anymore. And I personally think when, when Andy Darris joined the band, that's when the band was functioning again. Yeah. Because he was, he was giving the band what the band needed. I needed to get out. I needed the time off. And I needed those years afterwards. Even though it was painful then, mm -hmm. I, I, and I, of course, would not have 
put it in words like I do now, but looking back at it, I know very well that I needed some time off. You know, I needed those years for myself. And and Halloween got definitely saved by Andy Darius in those years. Yeah. It, you know, that, that was that was a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, because you had the problems in the band, but you also had troubles with noise records, a complete disaster there. Uh, you you went to EMI. I, I, I read somewhere that the 1991 album Pink Bubbles Go Ape uh, in Germany was only for sale as an import record. Um, well, no, no, I don't know. I, maybe it even was. That was a very crazy time, which was also something that was definitely not helping, you know, with the band spirit to be injuncted for two years and stuff. We have been screwed by the record company and we could prove yeah. it. And, and we won all the cases to prove it. But then somehow the guy managed to get us injuncted and, and forcing us to negotiate and stuff like that. That was pretty crappy. It's a, it's an industry that is led by sharks, you know, yeah. and, and musicians are usually naive. It's like the, the, yeah. you, you can look at it. The good musicians, they don't have the energy for business. If you, if you do what you do passionately, you can't deal with business. You either have people taking care of this side True. for you, or you will be screwed. And that's the situation so many musicians have been in. You know, it's like I'm 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 very creative, but I'm so bad on my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's, it's the same with me. I hate yeah. it. Um, did you follow Halloween in the 90s? Did you oh, no, heard I, the music I, or did you completely shut it down? I shut it completely down. I refused to. I mean, sometimes I couldn't escape it, of course. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. you see something on TV or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I was refusing. I was hurt. I was disappointed. Yeah. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. And that to that went down for years, you know. It was like very, very slowly. Uh, I was kind of getting a little more relaxed about these things at the end of the '90s, and and certainly over the two the first parts of the 2000 years, you know, mm -hmm. it was getting step by step um, um, more easy going with these kind of things. And but it was a long process. It really was a long process. I I, I didn't listen to the to the to the albums that they did with Andy until actually the, the Pumpkins United plan. Yeah. Up, you know, I can understand. Yeah. Um, I must say that there's one album I like very much. Uh, I like any of them actually. No, I've got them all. There's one album I don't have and you can't guess which one that is. Which one is it? Chameleon. All right, right. That's the only one. I, yeah. But a better than raw. I think that is really a great album. As for me, that is one. It's my favorite album with with Andy. Let's uh, let's say that. I, it was like many. I mean, when we did the Chameleon album, it was still an honest record, but we were just not a band anymore. You know, we were just everyone was making some sort of a solo record together, yeah. not together, like individually, like the White Album from the Beatles. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it was not. It was not really a, a band effort anymore. I've, I've I've written some cool stuff on the album, like I Believe, for instance, yeah. and and Longing and stuff like that. And I know many people who nowadays like this album. I don't because I don't like the face. I don't like I don't like Pink Bubbles and Chameleon because of the face the band was in. Mm -hmm. uh, it was representing what was going down, but it's like uh, to me the Keeper Records that was. That was when that band was functioning. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Were you surprised when you heard about the first ideas of the Pumpkins United project? Yeah, I was actually a little bit pissed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard, honestly, I heard Andy Darris talking in an interview about it years yeah. before, and I was like, "What is he talking about? You know, that's never going to happen." Uh, and. Um, And um, because he was he was your replacement, he was your yeah. let's say enemy, or is that too hard? Really my, I didn't know him, but no, but it was it was of course in both ways. I think it was it was um, not connected with the best emotions. And he, I always when I saw him, it was always the dude who got my job. Yeah, yeah. and the other way around, he was getting a lot of backfire from Kiska fans too. You know. Um, well, uh, especially in the, in the in the in the in the first number of years when that was in, you know, the thing when we when we the whole Pumpkins United thing took forever to actually become possible. It was 
it started off. I'm trying to make that very short. Okay, it started off with you know Avantasia, to- Tobias kind of convincing me to, to actually lay down some vocals on on this type of songs again. You know, with uh, I don't know if you know the, the first Avantasia record. Uh, Reach out for the light for it was one of the songs that I did there. That oh yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was my first kind of move in this direction again. And then later on, Serafino from Frontiers Records was offering me a deal for my solo records, and then he was suggesting Plas Vendome, and we did four records, which were more into the hard rock direction as well, you know. And then out of that, the connection with Dennis Ward came together. And, and, and then later on, Dennis and Costa and, and I, we made Unisonic. And out of the, I think the first Avantasia tour, Kai Hansen was, was on that tour as well. And we, we started to be on stage together again. And then we started to talk, we gotta do something again. And then he joined Unisonic. So that was another step, you know, mm-hmm. touring with Kai together in Unisonic and, 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 and stuff like that. And then in 2013, I was running into Michael Wyckoff backstage on a festival uh, where I was playing again with Avantasia. And that was my inner game changer because he stood in front of me and he looked into my eyes and he said, what have I done that you can't forgive me? And what was it? And I was reaching into my soul and I was noticing I don't, I'm not angry anymore. So I said to him, you know what? I think I've forgiven you a long time ago. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was a game changer for myself. Realizing it was still no talk about pumpkins United or anything mm-hmm. like that. But I noticed something has changed. I'm not angry anymore. And it has a lot to do with knowing how important those years have been for me. You know, I don't want to miss them. I've learned so much spiritually and, and as an individual, I grew so much. Also, fighting with the metal scene was important, believe it or not. It was something that shaped my personality a lot. Um, you know, figuring out what's true music, you know, yeah. you have to stand for what you believe. The same thing we talked about earlier, you know. If you don't, if you do something other people think you should do, you're not yourself, are you? No. You, you got to do what you believe in. And, and, and that's what I always, and that's what I really defined a lot clearer during those years, also fighting with the metal scene. I got more in balance afterwards and, and noticed that I still like rocking music, you know? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be soft music. You know, it can be, it's okay to be a little aggressive sometimes, you know? It's a, it can be very liberating if it's not destructive, if it, if it, if it has a good cause, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but it's like, it, 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 even that was not, the game changer in that direction that I that I was thinking about a, a, a Pumpkins United kind of thing, and, but it was like the, it was later, like one and a half years later, something like that. We played with Unisonic in Spain three shows, and and it were great shows, it were great fun. Unisonic was starting to get there as a band and, and a good life band and stuff. And after one of those shows, Kai Hansen, who wanted to do this a long time, said to me, Michael, one day we just got to do something with Halloween again." before we're getting all too old, you know? And he said, and I said, you know what? I'm open. <laughs> and that was the, that right. was the real changing point because Costa was playing drums in mm-hmm. Unison. Costa's part of the bottom row management. And he was mentioning that to, in the office. And, and Jan Bayati uh, was then calling me up, wanting to check out how serious I am about this. And then uh, after he realized that I am actually open to it, he wanted me to have a long conversation with Michael Wyckoff on the phone, which we did. We cleared everything out. It was very, very um, healing. And then he wanted me to fly to Tenerife and spend some time with Andy Darius because he said, and that is very true, if you guys don't get along for whatever reason, we don't need to go any further because it's not going to make any sense if you, if you guys can't stand each other. So. I flew over to Tenerife and I spent about two weeks uh, almost every day with him. And he took me to all those places that he knows where you can eat well. Tenerife is beautiful, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, it was fantastic. And you know, I'm a very spiritual person. I, I absolutely know spir- certain spiritual things. It has nothing to do with religions. It has nothing to do with faith. I know certain spiritual things. And I, I always had a different look at life. I see more than most people see, you know, when you when I see a human being, I see a spiritual being in a physical body. I don't just see flesh and bones. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's like, so I have, I always have this sort of uh, spiritual approach to everything. Okay. And I'm, yeah. I'm, uh, so when I met him and I noticed, it feels like I know him. 
It was, it, was, it was really like, this is a karma family, it definitely is. You know, there's no doubt about it. There were, there, there, there's, a, there's a reason why this band creates some kind of magic together. It's always like that. It doesn't matter where you look. Uh, the interesting band is always some sort of karma family. They, I, they, I think it's so good to hear that it's, it's not a financial decision or it's not a, a business decision. It was also a personal decision. It's how you guys get along, <laughs> karma, yeah. etc. For me, in the beginning, that was the main motivation. Of course, yeah. the management uh, it has to take care of the business side and whatever. But it's like the, the, the band itself is so ignorant when it comes to money that it is almost dangerous. Uh, um, but it, like I said earlier, it's very normal for most of the bands. To, uh, you, you do this because of the music. You have to make your money. And it's great to make money. Okay? But it's like for me, the main motivation in the beginning was to make peace to get this out of my system. So I agreed yeah. to the tour and stuff. And we only made contracts for after the tour. Until But it's so after. good to hear that you guys did it for the good reason. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it has changed now. Now we love what we're doing. Now we love what came out of it. Yeah. Now, now, now this is important to me. Now this is like, now this feels like my mother shit again. Yeah. It feels like this is my band. And when I did the first couple of interviews, um, before we did the tour, the first tour in 2017, I was asked by one journalist if I if I see myself as a band member or if I see myself as a guest musician. And I said I see myself as a guest musician. I wouldn't see I wouldn't say that anymore. No. Because out of that grew something else. And and after after this first touring two months of touring in 2017, which were very hard for me because I was sick the whole time. I I caught something and I didn't get out of it. it was oh the nice. first leg of the tour in South America. Yeah. Yeah. It was really, really a very, very heavy test for me. Uh, we pulled it through, mm -hmm. you know, but it was the heaviest thing that I, that I ever went through in my entire life. And I, I, I was actually, I was, I, I was uh, damaging myself uh, physically because I, when you have a virus, you need to take time off yeah. and, and cure it out. I did not do that. And my immune system was already reacting in a funny way. It was getting into my left leg. It was, it was attacking the muscles of my, my left leg. I was I started to limp and I, I needed to drink a lot of red wine and throw in painkillers to even go on stage without limping. Wow. And my doctor later on said to me that this is the dumbest thing you can do um, because you can you can provoke an, an autoimmune reaction that you that okay. you can fight with your entire life. It didn't happen luckily. I had some problems with my I don't know what you call this the uh, thyroid thingy on your on your uh, I always I can't remember that name, but I, I was developing. I a year later, I was develop I was developing a big sort of thingy there, mm -hmm. which which I thought was which was in danger of being cancer, but it wasn't. Luckily, it was like for, for three months, no one was sure what it was. And the thing is, when you operate those out, there's a danger of losing your voice because they have to cut very close to the nerve that controls your vocal cords. Yeah. So that was another that was another sort of payback of not taking care of myself. It all went well. You didn't cut the nerve. It was the best doctor I can find in England. And a good and lesson. Remember, sorry. And and um, it wasn't cancer, yeah? But I think it was yeah. a, a, a reaction of my body because I treated myself like this. A later reaction of it, you know? But to get back to the story, Even though it was, it was that heavy, we grew together as a man. And after that, we made the decision, let's try to make an album. Yeah. You know, and we kind of renewed contracts. It was the contracts were made for this tour because nobody knew what was going to happen. You know, but you saw it on stage. You guys had a good synergy. It was a good energy. It was um, you guys had a great time on stage. Andy and you had those. You were really bonding. It was really great to see. And yeah, you can't it, play it, that. It, you can't act like, like that it was real you can act shortly but you will get sick if that's just you know we've done the video shoot on, like on, on monday what is the day last week like a week ago we did a video shoot for for another for another video that's going to come out it was just me and andy yeah with another person from another band and everybody's going to be surprised that, <laughs> uh, that that she is in that video um um And we were just laughing our asses off, honestly. It's like I, 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 I love Andy Dares. It's, it's it's great like, vibe. He's 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 a great dude, and, and, and we get along more than and we were friends now. Yeah. I, I consider him 
a friend now. And I could not do this. If that wouldn't be the case, you would have had that Pumpkins United tour, and that would have been it. Yeah. The reason that we're talking about an album that we have made and that is going to come out end of this week is because it worked out. When came the first ideas for the new Halloween album? After the 2017 tour. After this tour being so heavy and we still we still didn't kill each other, we actually liked There was never even a loud word going down between yeah. us, which was which was really amazing. But that's the great thing about Jan Bayati. He's a fantastic person. He's a he's a great manager, and but he's also very intelligent. So he he doesn't do stupid steps. You know? So he, everything goes carefully. He knows how extreme the characters in this band are. Mm -hmm. Everybody is very, very different. It's a very, very extreme bunch of people. It's a miracle that it works, that we don't. Yeah, I don't know why. It, probably it's the age. You know, when you get older, you you, you, you kind of get more easygoing. Yeah. I don't know if I said that to you in this interview or if it was the previous interview. <laughs> Michael Wycath was very difficult in the 80s. He's not anymore. No. He's like, he, he just wants everybody to be happy and... You know, and, and these things, everybody has changed, has changed, sorry. And that is also, the, I think, the um, the issue with songs on the record. You got seven members, you got six or seven songwriters. I think the older you get, the more easier it is to say, okay, pick another song, not my song. Um, yeah, as I said in another interview last week, I said, when you're young, you tend to say, me, me, me. <laughs> when you get older, him, let him do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other question. Um, how did, um, between the singing of you and Andy and maybe Kai a little, I guess there was not a lottery. How decided you uh, uh, which singer is going to be singing which song? Yeah, that was actually quite easy. We had Dennis Ward making a pre draft of what he thinks how it could work mm -hmm. he knows both singers very well um so he was he was going through the songs and 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 apart from the songs that were that were clear up front a song like angels for instance for instance uh sasha wrote the song for me he said he, he was he said he had he did send me the, the pretty much finished demo uh, in 2019, he said, I want you to sing it. So I sang the vocals on the demo. Everybody heard it, loved it. It was clear, you know. We added an extra part with Andy in the, re in the rehearsal room because we thought he was just singing that, you know. And we thought, yeah, that's perfect. That's great. And so he has that part in it. But the, the main part of the song was always meant to be sung by me. Yeah. So when the songwriter uh, writes a song with that specific singer in his mind, that's the way we did it. But most of the time... It was open, and 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 we wanted to have both singers there most of the time. Yeah. So we had Andy, and we had Dennis making a pre-draft, and that's how we tried it. And and if I felt uncomfortable with something, if I felt like uh, I don't know, maybe maybe Andy can do that better or whatever, uh, he gave it a try, and the other way around, and it was perfect. Especially between me and Andy, there was never any kind of composition. Competition. We were, we were basically just trying to figure out what's the best for the song. And that's the way it should be. Absolutely. On the first single, Skyfall, you sing all three, Kai, Andy, and you. And then the song has to be, it is an epic song in on the album, but it has to be cut in half for a radio edit. Yeah. I love epic songs. And for me, it seems to be super difficult to yeah. shorten such an epic song yeah but this time kai did it it's like when we did when when the record company in the 80s did this uh for the halloween track awful it, it was a record company who did it and that was a nightmare we yeah, hated, it was awful <laughs> we hated the video we hated the cut you know and this time kai did it himself mm -hmm. So it works, and I and I think it does work. I still prefer the long version, of course, but but this time it worked. I was against choosing that song in the beginning because of that reason, cutting it down, and it's also a pretty aggressive song. And sometimes for a single, it's better to have a more, you know, Mellow. a song that only metal yeah. fans can understand. But I, I I disagree with that now. I think it was a good choice because it, it went down so well. I mean, we even got number one in England in the single charts with it, which which was pretty amazing. In the physical single charts, eh? not the uh, stream yeah. charts. The yeah, a physical. Yeah. Single, yeah. yeah. Which was pretty amazing. So it wasn't a bad choice to do that, you know. Yeah. Um, 
The Drum Kit of former drummer and co-founder Ingo Schwichtenberg was in honor of Ingo used on the album. He passed away in 1995. Yeah. Uh, did Danny Leuble uh, use the drum kit in all the songs? Yeah, I think so. Wow. I, I think so. It it happened, I, I think, I, I don't know, I gotta ask him if that's how it came together. Because I remember that in 2017 or 18, must, could, it could have been 18, I was, I was running into a fan in Hamburg when I was in a shopping or approaching a shopping mall in front of a Saturn market. Mm -hmm. he, he was talk, we, we talked about almost like three hours or something like that. We were just starting to talk about these kind of things. And he was he mentioned to me that he owns the drum kit of Ingo. He bought it from Ingo sometime or okay. whatever. I don't remember. And he was asking me if I could arrange a meeting at, at one of the shows maybe in Hamburg or the show in Hamburg. We didn't play shows in Hamburg. We played one show in Hamburg. Um, if if I could arrange a meeting in one in the show in Hamburg, maybe for for the band to sign inside of the snare drum of of the drum kit, and I think that's how it came together. I never asked Danny if that's how it came together, but I'm pretty sure. I, I don't know that I don't think that there are so many fans with Ingo Swigert drums uh, in the world. So um, I, I, Danny had this idea, as far as I know, to, to buy the drums and to record with the drums. This would actually have the spirit of Ingo a little bit in, in the production. And it also makes the drum sound very different because the drum kits of the 80s sounded different to, to the drum kits today. I think it was a great idea to do this for yeah. Ingo. But I know I know a few drummers and they swear by their own gear. Was it yeah. difficult for Danny on, to, to drum on this kit he doesn't know? I don't know. You got to ask him, but I don't think so. I don't think so. Uh, he's a, he's like the incarnation of discipline, you know. He's like he, he's he, there's no one in the band. Sasha is a little like that, but he's not as as extreme. Donnie is a worker, and he I worked his ass off during the shows. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but also the way he is he's taking his body under discipline, the way he eats, the the sports he does. He's he's the one taking care 100 percent about about his body being in shape to do what he does. So I have I can't imagine that there's any drum kit he couldn't play on, you know. Okay. Then you got the album, the, the production, the mix. Um what I said, you had seven members, seven opinions about the sound. Right. Um how was it the the contribution in the sound of the uh, the, the sound in the mix? How, how went that between you seven guys? Who decided think, to? This think, is the sound. I think it was too ma too much influence of the band, because I I think if you when you pay a great mixer, which we did, when you pay a guy who knows what he does mm -hmm. to to make an album, you should let him do it. You know. Yeah. And if if there's something you disagree with, you can you can say that. Okay. But I think someone like Kai, for instance, has way too much influence on the mix, and I'm surprised that the guy. Who did the mix actually allowed this to happen? And uh, when we do another record, which we hope, which I hope we do, mm -hmm. uh, sometime down the line, I will I will bring it up in a meeting that we should when we pay someone money to do the job, we gotta let the guy or the girl do the job. You know, it's it sounds great in the end, but it took forever yeah. because everything got twisted into this direction. It sounded great in the beginning, and then things got changed because someone says this or that or whatever. And then it lost the sound again, and then they were trying to recreate it and stuff like. It took forever. Yeah. It, co it cost a fortune, <laughs> and it was just because the musicians talking too much into the mix. I was sticking out of it completely. Yeah, I, like I was letting. I, I my argument with Jan was we pay this guy to do the job, and I tend to trust him that he knows what he's doing because otherwise he wouldn't be where he is today. So, yeah. and he, he was thankful with it, but there are other people in this <laughs> band who just can't stick out of it. They just always have to get their opinions across. You know? Maybe they're very, they want to have it very per perfect. They're perfectionists or... What perfect? You yeah. know what I mean? But it then is, you got seven <laughs> guys who want that. Opinions, you know, yeah. everybody has an opinion. And, and um Normally, when you when you work with a with a with a mixer that work with people like um, Lady Gaga and stuff like that, 
they know what they're doing. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. The reason why they got these big names uh, in the industry. Uh, Chris Lorology, for instance, when you when you look look at the stuff that the, the guy knows what he does, he he has produced the greatest acts that have that there have, have been on the planet, you know. And 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 uh, if you pay a guy like that yeah. make a mix, you better let him do it because if you can do it better, do it yourself. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think it's it's not a question of being a. We think it is. We want it perfect, but what is perfect doesn't exist. You just it's 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 in the end it's just a it's a question of ego being able to step back and let someone else do the job he, he gets paid for. Give it out of your hands and yes. let the other guy who knows what he does yeah. do it. Exactly. And if something is completely wrong, of course you say something. <laughs> yeah. But these guys don't make anything completely wrong. They're not capable of doing anything completely wrong. What's your favorite song on the album, Michael? I have a whole bunch. I definitely love Skyfall. I'm so glad that Kai came up with it because for a long time it looked like you wouldn't even have a song. Really? He's, yeah, he's very lazy these days. You know, he was and and uh, and and we were all happy when he when he came up with the song and he finally finished it. He had like parts of it for a long time, but he he didn't finish it. And and when I did the vocals for it, the way Dennis Ward was suggesting it, everybody was happy because it worked. Yeah. You, you just very often, and that's the, the those are the very happy moments for any musician. You record something, and you notice this works. And and uh, I had that feeling very often with many songs, but especially Skyfall. I felt at home right away. Yeah, and and it and it turned out great. I love uh, the same. I had the same experience with Out Out, out for the Glory. I I did not understand why he's demos. Because he was singing on the demos, and he really cannot sing. <laughs> What he does is screaming like someone's trying to slaughter him, you know. And and he, he, sometimes you even can't figure out the melodies. That he's trying to do. It's, just, it's just circling around something. He knows exactly what he wants, but he can't pull it off. Vocal. Squeak, 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 squeak. <laughs> And I was not understanding. We had the first meeting where he was playing these songs, and I said very right away, "I don't know what he's trying to say with this. I don't get it." And then the rest of the band said, "Oh, don't worry about it. We we know his demos. It's going to be fine. Trust me. That's yeah. a good song." I said, "Okay, okay." And so I I did not even practice uh, uh, any of those songs really. I, I practiced Angel because I I did uh, a demo version of that one earlier, and some parts here and there. Um, I also laid some vocals on, on the ballad from Andy, which I think is fantastic, but it didn't make it on the album. Mm -hmm. um, so when I was in the studio and recording, uh, started to record uh, Out for the Glory, I was right on that evening learning the song and then doing the performance. And I, I had the same feeling. It felt like home. It felt like in the old days, you know, the it felt like, like a keeper song. Uh, so that's a favorite of mine. Angel, I love. I love the stuff that Andy does always. I, th I think the songs of Andy are always spot on. There's there's a very there's a very personal trademark in his songs. I think you can always tell it's an Andy song, pretty much. You know. In, in various interviews, I read that Andy wrote a beautiful ballad that didn't make it on the album. Yeah, that's what I just said. Yeah. I, I, That was one where I was also laying uh, vocals down. The reason why it didn't end up on the album is that the, the the producers, including Andy, were not too happy with how it turned out in the end because they changed it a lot. Hmm. It used to be much higher key. That's how. That's when I did the vocals. That's yeah. how he's going to go back. That's, that's This is the way we're going to record it again next time. Okay. Uh, with the original key. And pretty much the way it was in, in the original idea, which is sometimes the best way of doing it. So we But can they, expect that song in the future. Yeah, it'll, it'll be. An, I'm, I'm very sad that it isn't on the album because mm -hmm. it, I think a song like that would give the album an even better balance. Now everything's heavy, you know. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like uh, I, I even like the the version they ended up with. I even thought that was great. But it had a lower key, so the, the it had a different sort of tension in the vocals. Uh, and they didn't like it. They weren't too happy with it. So that it's got it, it got moved to the next production again. Okay. What's your favorite song overall in the Halloween discography to sing? Uh, my favorite song is not 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 necessarily my favorite to sing. 
uh, it's a different kind of thing because as a singer, you the, the favorite songs to sing are the ones that are easy to sing, you know, mm -hmm. the, where you can just fool around and the difficult ones are the bitches. But the best ones are very often sometimes the ones that are difficult to sing. Um, one of my all-time favorites definitely is Eagle Fly Free. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just, that was like, I think that's the, the, the best song Waiki has ever written. And I think that that this song, like a few of his songs, including Keeper of the Seven Keys, Dr. Steen, and you can just as well play just as many Kai Hansen songs next to it, like March of Time, you know what I mean? Yeah. These songs uh, defined the sound of Halloween, at least in my era. And then with Andy, new elements came to it. You know, they, they, they developed a new kind of Halloween sound that sounded like Halloween, but it's an, it had a new approach to it. Yeah. So it's, it's a much bigger kind of sound that we can do these days. But when it comes to my time in the band in the 80s, those songs define it. And it's my favorite tracks will always be Eagle Fly Free, March of Time, um, but, but also songs we haven't played on the last tour. Um, I, I, and I hope we will. I would love to play mm -hmm. Twilight of the Gods or oh, yeah. Save Us or, you know, even We Got the Ride. It's a song that, that's much loved by fans, which is very interesting, which is a song of mine. And I remember we played it on the Keep Up Seven Keys uh, Part 2 tour. Yeah. And it was an amazing life because it has this marching rhythm and, and this slow part. And it was always like giving a, 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 a nice extra touch to the whole show. Maybe we play it this time. I'd love it. I suggested yeah. it, you know. You talked about Eagle Fly Free. Um, I'm, I was sitting in my home studio last weekend and I listened to the live version in the 80s. I listened to the live version uh, um, with the Pumpkin United tour. How do you keep your voice in such a shape? Because there was not much of a difference. I'm just sounding fuller, really. I mean, like when I... When I I'm judging myself, of course, too. You know, I'm, I'm comparing myself too. The, the biggest difference, and that has to do with the getting older physically. And that was also the case, like uh, when I was out of Halloween, my voice was changing because I was getting older. It's like when you are, when you just turned 18 and you record an album, you were a teenager and you sound like a teenager. Your, your body is still changing a lot, you know, uh, in the 20 years when you when you get closer to 30 and whatever. So my, my voice has a better sound. I, I, I sound better. I sound fuller. Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and I don't have any problems with the with the heights. The the only difference is I have to prepare more. When I was a teenager, I did not have to prepare in any way. The rehearsing for like two weeks or three weeks was completely enough to to be in shape um, for a tour. And this is not. I can't do that anymore. I have to do sports. I have to. Not only do I, have, do I have to fight like very heavily with my weight these days because I, I put on weight just looking at a pizza. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And it's painful. I really, really have to hunger and move and, and uh, be active as much as I can to get just near looking like a human being. But it's like, <laughs> but it's like in, uh, that's when it comes to my, my diaphragm, my, my, my singing organ, I have to do sports. I have to, I have to bicycle, and I and I have to like at least six weeks before we we start touring. I have to start singing the songs, and always just to the point until I get tired. Yeah, this is when you have to stop. It's a good tip for <laughs> anyone who tries to get in shape. Sing as long as it feels good, and when you get tired, stop. Maybe one more song if you want to push it, but. The best is to stop. And then the next day or the second day, you do it again. And you always sing until the point that it is cool and feels right. And you, you do that. You figure out how much time you need to get to the point that you can sing the whole show, yeah. all sad, and you still feel fine. And, and even that is just going to be 70% of the energy that you're going to need live because live – you always burn out a lot quicker because you are excited. You know, you get excited out of the moment. Um, but I got to do this th these days. I have to get myself physically into shape to do a tour. That's the only difference. Take small steps to get get in a great shape in yeah. your singing performance. It's so much heavier. So much heavier. I'm always thinking about uh, Sylvester Stallone. 
who I love. I grew up with the guy. And it's like Rambo one, the first blot, that was like a, a lifesaver for me. I don't it's like I don't know how, why, but as a young one, you feed from these kind of fighters and uh, I, I I love Stallone. I, I um, not not all of the movies. I didn't like the other Rambo's, but the first Rambo was amazing, and I love Rocky. Uh, yeah. The whole Rocky story it was really important for me. And he 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 mentioned already years ago um, when he was when he was doing Rocky V how difficult it is for him, and he still looks amazing. I mean, the guy is I don't know over seventy now, isn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at his body. He's still in shape. It's unbelievable. He looks 10 times better than me, and I'm 53. But it's like he said how difficult it is to get himself into into the shape to do a movie like that and do boxing scenes, you know? Yeah. And uh, a great guy. Great. I love that guy. Well, we talked before about uh, f physical records about uh, buying a record and not streaming a record, you know, yeah. stream to get new discover new bands, discover new uh, songs, new albums, but when you love an album, you buy it. Yes. Um, what because can you tell us about the... It was the, 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 the music production, the, the record production uh, quality. We, yeah. we were able to make this album with because we got so much money to do it from this amazing dude from the record company, you know, Steiger. Yeah. The guy is a, a huge fan of the band, but that's not the normal situation. No. The mo most bands need to get the money in to make good productions. And if people don't buy CDs, you know, yeah. it's not for the reason of owning the music, which should be enough, you know, actually. But for the sake of making good productions financeable, yeah. we have to change that. It's understandable that, sorry, but I, I, I interrupted you with the question. No. It's an important issue. It's like... I couldn't it's, agree more what you're saying. When the internet came up and yeah. the digital ages, it's understandable that things go this way for a while. But we should reconsider musical culture. Yeah. You know, because music is not only about life. I think an album is an art form of itself, and I love it. And I still buy records, and I still get like even productions of the '70s of Billy Joel, Elton John, or Foreigner, or whatever. All these bands who were big in the '70s that I still like, I, like I, I buy them as super audio CDs or DVD audio, high resolution audio mixes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And it blows you away. And these type of productions, who does it? These days, no one has the money, or if he has, he knows he would just put his private money in it and it would be gone to make an album. Yeah. We need to make record productions financeable again by supporting CDs or LPs, which are coming back and stuff like that. Yeah. People should really rethink these kind of things. You know, the younger generations are not dumb. They're just used to the situation and they don't think about it. But I think it's on us, older generations, To, to, to teach them a little about the culture that we grew up in, the musical culture. And maybe we can make a turn. Maybe we yeah. can make things bloom again. Why not, you know? And maybe we, we as metal fans, or a metal band, is kind of lucky because yeah. we are, no, you know, fanatics and we buy albums, we buy vinyl. Yeah. Pop artists... Have difficulties, yeah. Yes, have difficulties, It's very true. The metal scene is, is pretty different when it comes to that. They, they really do care about having the physical recording. You know, they, they want something in their hands. And they That's great about it. Maybe we can be an example, you know. Maybe we can show uh, the, the rest of the world uh, an example of, of bringing uh, record production culture back. Yeah. You know, it's a loss. It's a loss. And, and, and uh And I, I don't want to be people. We always complain about these things because it sucks, and so many lose their jobs. It's, it's not only the musicians who only live by live playing, which they can't do at the moment either. But but it's there's also so many people that work in jobs, and yeah. in the, in the, in the, 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 so many have lost their their jobs. Absolutely, you know, because people do, do not support the the record itself anymore. And I think it's on us now to change that. To yeah. learn out of these kind of things, because I, the only thing that I really care about in this life is music. You know, it's the only thing that that made life, apart from the spiritual journey, of course, but it was the only thing that made life worth living to me was yeah. music. I, I I ask this question on behalf of lots of the listeners and lots of my friends. Um, the artwork, 
I saw a picture looks brilliant. Yeah. What can you tell us about the artwork? But what can you tell us about you know the physical records that is coming out? Are there special issues? Are there yeah. special uh, editions of the vinyl, uh, colored vinyl? Do you know anything about it? Oh yeah, I have a big box in in in, in the down down area. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> just that I just received two days ago, on Saturday I think from from Markus Steiger. Yeah. Uh, with all the, it's it's gonna look great you know it's like we want we were pretty clear what what kind of a cover we wanted we wanted a cover that kind of represents the whole past of the band because mm -hmm. that's what the the first tour was about you know it's like the, we're getting back together we're doing something together and we wanted to have a cover that sort of represents that a little bit but we did not want something that has been done on a computer We, we wanted a real painting, and that's what the guy did. You know, this is a real oil painting that he did. Wow. Uh, uh, and I think it's the best cover Halloween has ever done, in my opinion. And, uh, um, and um, like, media is like, like vinyl or those big boxes that have the size of an LP, but you have CDs in there and maybe posters and stickers and stuff like that. They're obviously much better for the for the artwork because you can see much more the details of, of the paintings and stuff and we do all of that you know yeah. it's like you can you, you can just buy the normal cd um of course but you can also get like real um merchandise articles like real fan items yeah beautiful they spend a lot of time to make it interesting and attra attractive yeah so that they get something for their money and this is the way to go but again Smaller bands can't do that. No, you know they don't have the money to put in to make an album attractive. And if they don't sell, they just lose a fortune. We have the luck, you know, that we have a an established name, so that that the record company doesn't doesn't risk too much by investing. And that's why you will get all those wonderful versions of the CD. Yeah. But people need to support albums more, uh, e even digital downloads. But I'm talking about physical uh, al albums, mm -hmm. whether that's been vinyl, CDs, or whatever comes out in the future um, for the sake of financing these kind of things, you know? Yeah. Then I got la the, the last question. We ask that always. The album is coming out on Friday. This show is going to be online on Friday. All right. Which song do you want us to play from the new album? Uh, out for the Glory. Okay, I think I think that's something that especially old Halloween fans <laughs> love right away. But you could also play, uh, but it's known, it's known. They they've done this uh, cheaper video of it, uh, "Fear of the Fallen." Yeah, it, it's a song that Andy wrote, but it has also it also has a keeper vibe, which is interesting. <laughs> you know, he was he was writing the song with both of us in mind. He, he, right away, he said, "I'm writing the chorus that there's no time to breathe." So it can't be sung by one singer. So he was doing it in a way that the one sings one line and then the other one takes over. So it's not possible to sing for one person. Yeah. And that's also a great track. You could also play the full version of Skyfall. Skyfall. <laughs> As I said, I yeah. love epic tracks. So yeah. we'll see. Thank you very much. Love to talk yeah. to you. Thank you. Love to talk to you. I'm looking forward to the new album. I'm going to buy it on vinyl. Yeah. You can for sure for right. that. Like you, you, you can open it up and then you can see the whole painting. The painting is yeah. huge. It's not just the front cover. It's also like like areas on, on the left and the right. I I will have a word with with Bayati about this, but I think we should make a real uh, a, a photo poster, like a real high quality poster, yeah. not just the small ones, like a like a like a maybe the actual size of the painting. Wow. As, a, as a poster, something like that, yeah. because it's beautiful. It yeah, would, it's it, beautiful. It's almost no, asked for it. I'm I, in the eighties. I was so stupid. I bought also the Keeper two album on vinyl, but right. then afterwards I had the side CD and the album, and then I threw away my 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 pickup, and then I decided to uh, give the album away. Yeah, and I did, I so did. stupid. There are a whole bunch of records that I gave away because I was so excited about CDs. Yeah. Not a good choice. No, good, no. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Beautiful Monday, Michael. And yeah. uh, I hope to see you on tour. I'm I'm sure you will. I mean, this is not going to take forever. And even okay. if the bitch turns up again more aggressively or something like that, which I, we, which we all don't hope, it's going to be over one day. Yeah. You know? And then live playing is going to come back. And I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty pretty sure it, it, it'll be over next year. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Beautiful day. Bye bye. Take care of yourself. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. NPO Radio 2.